Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. We are here for the first episode of our Road to Unlimited build. Uh, one that I'm very excited to share with you guys because it is going to be uh, basically the transition from going to a competitive street class car. We did everything we wanted to do there. We were super happy and now we want to go chase the big boys in Unlimited. So. Uh, there's quite a lot that we're gonna do to the car. We, uh, just like we did in street class, where we opened up the rule book and we said, what can we do? Uh, I did the same thing last year with the unlimited class rule book and made a ton of things that I wanna do. It's gonna happen in phases, but for this first phase, uh, it's gonna be kind of the bigger items that we need to knock out and stuff that we can do in time for November. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of that with you. So uh, the car looks exactly the same. And the reason is that uh, we just got the car finished or we got the car back together for race services, rise and shine, meet which is really cool and it's about to go to Riley in two days which is Saturday to start all of the chassis work and some other very exciting things so let me show you what's happened so far so as I mentioned before uh, from the outside this car still looks the same one little notice if you have a keen eye and you know the car really well you can now see the coil rad radiator in there and before you couldn't because we had a water to air intercooler in there and uh, it was a very very good setup I couldn't have been happier with it our intake air temps were amazing and for a car where we are unable to do much to the chassis in terms of like cutting it and uh, working with airflow in the rear it 100% made the most sense and worked very very well the reason we're changing it is because an air to air setup can be a bit lighter uh, especially with the setup that we're going to be using we're going to be using a coil rad tube and fin intercooler core with custom end tanks. Riley's going to be making that. So tube and fin intercooler cores are very efficient and also much lighter than the typical bar and plate style. Uh, there's pros and cons to both because I'm very, very big on weight and uh, I want it to be as efficient as possible. We're going with the tube and fin. So I know it's gonna work really well for us. Uh, next up is going to be here in the middle of the car. Uh, this one is very obvious. We no longer have any interior. So I spent quite a while pulling out all of the harnesses and everything out of this car. I will show you the weight of the wiring in just a bit. I think it's pretty shocking. Uh, the car has a few things in it since it's going to Riley. That is the coil rad uh, intercooler core and then some of the wiring for the ABS that had to stay in there. And then here we've got a Bosch Motorsport drive-by wire throttle body, which uh, just looks like a throttle body. Let's see if we can pull this thing out. So typical, nothing too special. They're actually fairly reasonably priced. I think this is only a couple hundred dollars, it's pretty cheap. And then a very nice CNC adapter plate that Andrew Horn from uh, Jaw Sports made for me. Very nice guy, thank you very much, Andrew. And everything else has been pulled out. So, uh, we saved a substantial amount of weight there. Uh, I'll share a little bit more of that once I kind of have all of that and once I get it weighed, but the wiring we have set out. And then in the rear, the taillights uh, look kind of goofy because I gutted them out, took the LED components that were in there. Every ounce counts. We saved about a pound and a half there. And we've been doing that throughout the car. Underneath, everything's still there, but that's going to change very, very soon. So, uh, yeah, let's take a look at some of that wiring. All right, so I've taken quite a bit of stuff out of the car and unfortunately I didn't weigh all of it. I'll give you a weight at the end of this so you know what the total is. But one thing that I thought was pretty interesting was the weight of the wiring. So this is our first box, 16.3 pounds. And as you can see here, we have fuse boxes, a couple of miscellaneous, uh, uh, I think just modules. I believe this is the one that was for, let's see, what does that say? Unit assembly. Uh, I think that was an anti-theft, so you needed that to actually for the car to start. Um, and I never really wanted to tackle the wiring because it's a big project, especially with everything that I was going to have running. So 16.3 pounds right there. And then we've got this far larger box, which has all of the connectors for the chassis and all the stuff that was inside the cabin and the front bay. So let's add that to it and see what it is. 56 pounds. So that is an Absolutely massive amount of weight to save for basically free. Took that out of the car. I'm gonna have to put a PDM and uh, a wiring harness in there, but why don't we pull the PDM and weigh that? All right, so we have the PDM and the majority of the wiring and connectors that we're going to use for the PDM. We've got a bunch of Tefzil wire in there, a little spool of it right there, a bunch of Deutsch connectors from ProWire. 
So right here, a bunch of these little guys. So I don't think I'll be using anyone near this much. I just bought a few extras. We've also got our PDM in there and the rear view camera display. And that comes in at, what do we got? 10.9 pounds. So that is massively lighter than the uh, all of the electronics that we had uh, earlier. Those two big boxes. So that was 56 pounds. That's about 11. So that brings us to 45 pounds of weight savings. So can't ask for more than that. And essentially it was a cost of a PDM and some wires, which we were going to do anyway. So as far as I'm concerned, feels like free weight savings because I was gonna do that for reliability. So uh, next is the electronics package. We have some pretty cool stuff there and some stuff you've already seen. So let's go check that out. We are going to start with our AIM PDM32. So this is a fairly new unit on the market. Uh, came out last year sometime and has some very cool features. I'll start with the pros and then get to the cons. So the pros are it has 32 uh, outputs. They are going to be half bridge, high, medium, and low. And that's gonna be the different amperage ratings or basically how much current it can use. The half bridge um, is going to be a 35, uh, 35 amp circuit that also has the half bridge feature, which is really cool. Uh, if you know how to use it, you can go over that in a little bit more detail later if you'd like. You have your high amperage, which is going to be 20, medium, which is 15, and low, which is 10, which is pretty significant uh, considering how many outputs that is and what most cars have. Uh, our car has quite a lot of electronics and still doesn't use them all. It uses a rad sock connector, which is a nice little Amphenol connector. So cool little guy there. Pretty neat, I like these. Uh, our kill switch, which I'll go over in more detail over there, uses them as well, uses the rad lock. Uh, another really neat feature about this guy is it has a display. So you can get it in a 10 inch or a six inch display. This is the 10 inch version that uh, I'm gonna be using as a rear view camera. I'm not gonna be using it for logging or anything like that. But with that said, it does have a GPS unit and it is a data logger. So for, I think it's like $2,700, you get a display, which will show you all of your engine vitals, lap timing, predictive timing, all that fun stuff, uh, temperatures, when it comes with the GPS module for all the lap timing stuff, and the data logger is internal to this. So, for how much you are spending, it is a really neat unit, um, super awesome piece. The, there are a few downsides with it that I've heard. I haven't personally used it, so I'm kind of nervous because for me, reliability and robustness is critical, and our last AIM dash did a very good job, but we haven't used this one. So what I've heard is A, the half bridge outputs are, they do not work. So the firmware doesn't have them there. It's been out for a year already, doesn't work. Supposedly it's coming. I could be wrong, I haven't checked the firmware lately, but uh, that would be one thing. I've also heard they tend to overheat, which is not a good thing. So uh, if they're left out in an, uh, a very open area, they will overheat and not work. So I'm gonna test that out and I'll probably just put it somewhere where it's gonna be uh, not sitting out in the sun in the paddock uh, when it's sitting between sessions. And then I've also heard that when you load it up with a lot of uh, alarms, can, uh, can inputs and outputs, it does get slow and laggy. So that's the primary reason why I'm not gonna use it as a display. And also I wanted to use uh, something from MoTeC, which I'll go over uh, in just a moment. So those are the pros and cons of this guy. Uh, I will let you know with some time uh, what it ends up being like. Hopefully it ends up being very well and I never have to take it out of the car, but uh, I will let you know. And then next, let's look at our kill switch. Up next is our battery isolator from ECU Master. This is uh, their Autosport version. So it has this nice little Autosport connector on it and works, uh, it's pretty cool, solid state. You can operate it through CAN, send that CAN message to the ECU uh, to integrate it into your electronics package if you choose to. They give you the, or when you buy it, it comes with the Autosport connector as well as the Amphenol Radlocks. So the AIM uses a very, very similar uh, connector to this. Pretty neat. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to try it out because it looked kind of cool and I'd heard good things. So have this and uh, not too much to talk about there. Next is our MoTeC Dash. That brings us to our MoTeC C127 Dash. Uh, this is our data logger that we're gonna be using and display, nice guy right here. High quality, nice uh, aluminum housing. And uh, I'll go over the reasons that I went with the C127. Number one, I wanted something that was very robust and was going to work 100% of the time. Number two, it has uh, a lot of options such as display creator. We can make custom displays and do whatever you want with it. It is a very, uh, a very high quality unit and I wanted to have the robustness along with the ability to customize it. So that was a big thing for me. And uh, I get the question a lot of should I get 
an aim dash or should I get a MoTeC dash? And I'm gonna go over kind of the very quick pros and cons of both. Uh, aim, the pros are when you buy it, everything is unlocked. So you get all of the functionality, all of the, uh, basically all of the features that it has. You pay one price, you get it all. The software, you get it, it's free, you can download it online and do whatever you want with it. Math channels, uh, different profiles, whatever you want. Uh, MoTeC is different because when you buy this, oh, and so the let's say the aim dash is like $2,700, maybe a little bit more if you go with the MXG, which is a little bit larger, comparable to this size. The C127, as this one sits right here, this is I think a $2,500, $2,600 unit, and this is basically a fancy display. It will not do anything other than show me what uh, whatever the ECU or inputs that I put into this uh, as a display. So it doesn't record it, doesn't log it, doesn't do anything. With that said, it is all available inside of it, so you have to, unlock it so there's firmware that you pay for and you get that with the c127 so if you want logging you pay more for that if you want a display creator so you go in and you can make your own custom designs and displays you pay for that if you want i2 pro so the whole reason for buying a motec dash and data logger is that they have excellent software and excellent logging capabilities so you want to be able to use that you pay extra for that so it's kind of uh the price is a little misleading you buy it for 24 2700 c125s are a little bit less and then you add a bunch of stuff and it ends up being like a 4500 dollar uh plus uh, data logger. So awesome piece, ultra reliable. And that's the reason why I decided to go with the C127. To be quite honest, I have had a couple of issues with AIM. I, when I went to Rhode Atlanta two years ago or back in 2020, three years ago, two years ago, uh, we went out and got zero data. Like it literally did not record a single lap. And it might've been because of a battery issue on my end. We're not sure, uh, kind of 50, 50, but regardless, it didn't work. So I wanted something that I knew 100% would work. And that's why I went with the MoTeC and uh, you could go with either of them. I've used AIM for years and had no issues, worked on cars with MoTeC, no issues, just expensive. So, but you get what you pay for. And that leads us to something that we've already seen, but it's so cool and so crucial to this package. I'm gonna show it again in case you didn't see the last video. And that is our ECU and wiring harness for the engine. The last part of our electronics package and the one that I am most excited about is our Mtron KVA ECU and Rywire engine harness, uh, their mil-spec variant, uh, the custom one for this ECU and for our application. I showed this in the last episode, but just in case you haven't seen it and just so I can be complete with electronics, I wanted to show you again. So Rywire makes some amazing products. Let's see if you can see their tag right there, Rywire. Super cool, uh, easy, one stop. I was in a huge rush and I told Ryan that I needed a custom harness. He took care of everything that has everything I need. Let's see if that, that's not gonna focus, but it says shift valves. So this goes to the state of sequential, uh, drive-by wire, EGTs, everything that I wanted is all in there. It was done quickly, it was done professionally, and I know it's gonna work. So amazing, thank you to Ryan for getting this done. Uh, excited to get this in the car. And last and definitely not least is our Mtron KV8. So if you know anything about time attack, then Mtron and the KV8 are going to be nothing new to you. The fastest time attack cars in the world, no ifs, ands, or buts, are all on Mtron and the KV8. Uh, we have got Tilton Evo, we have got MCA Hammerhead, and finally RP968, the fastest time attack car in the world, all on the KV8. Our good friend Brett Dickey in the elusive car also runs on the KV8. And after talking to all of them, uh, I, it was kind of a no brainer. So I decided to go with the KV8 for their phenomenal torque modeling and their very, very sophisticated traction control and paddle control. So that's why I decided to go with that. Super, super excited. Um, and that basically sums up our electronics package. So thanks for checking that out. And I guess we'll go over a few of the things that we've got planned for the rest of the build up to November and then we'll call it. It is the 4th or 5th of August, and in two days we are taking the car to Riley to get the rest of the chassis and fab work done. So uh, we're gonna do a few things. I'm gonna go over very brief uh, kind of description, so that way I don't spoil it for you guys. Uh, we're gonna cut some weight out, move some things around for the turbo. We're gonna add some structure to the cage to since we can now make it structural, and we're gonna clear out some area in the front for airflow and also to maybe cut some weight out if we're lucky. But uh, really excited to get it to Riley. He absolutely smashes it every time he gets the car, uh, whether it's my car or customer cars, like uh, that M3 you can see back there uh, that he did the cage on and nailed it on that. So get it to him. That's gonna be probably a couple of episodes you guys will not wanna miss because his work is unreal. 
And other than that, that's our electronics package. That's some of the weight we've cut out of the car and step one. So excited to show you guys the rest. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you guys at the next one.